All right, so tonight we're going to be talking primarily about cookbooks. Um, and I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer because we're going to be covering, um, you know, over 200 years of cookbook history basically in one talk. And this is definitely not, um, uh, you know, we're not going to cover everything. There's tens of thousands of American cookbooks that we could talk about. So it's fairly subjective. I'm going to talk about the ones that I think are important uh, to American history and kind of representative of where American cuisine um, was headed in the various time periods of American history. So we're going to start. Oh, if it lets me. There we go. We're going to start way back um, with what's known as the Columbian Exchange. So American cuisine is very much informed by uh, the indigenous foods of the Americas, North and South America. And this term, the Columbian Exchange, is one that was coined in the 1970s by an anthropologist and historian. And essentially, it's the exchange of agricultural products, primarily, between the old world and the new world, right? So the old world brought um, not that much of the agricultural products. The most significant ones were grain and livestock, you know, domesticated livestock, um, sugar cane, and then unfortunately diseases, right, that really um, decimated a lot of indigenous populations in both North and South America. And I think the rest of the world got the better end of the bargain because what the rest of the world got were what have become some really incredible staple crops uh, throughout the world. So the really big ones uh, being potatoes, tomatoes, corn, uh, beans, chocolate, vanilla, and peppers. So there's a bunch of other ones on there too. Um, but those are probably the most influential. Like when you think of Italian food, you probably think of tomatoes. And when you think of German food, you probably think of potatoes. And when you think of chocolate, you probably think of Switzerland. But all of these foods are from North and South America that were really only introduced to the rest of the world after 1492, right? So it's the 16th century primarily when a lot of these foods are being introduced to the rest of the world and they're having a really huge impact. Um, and not just in Europe either. Um, cassava is very important in Africa and a lot of um, uh, Southeast Asian company, countries, excuse me, and then pepper, including chili pepper, if you think about a lot of Asian cuisines without hot peppers and chili peppers, you know, that's, that's a more recent introduction than I think a lot of people realize. So this is kind of the foundation of American food is the meeting of these two sets of cuisines and kind of two sets of indigenous foods. So in the United States, we have both indigenous and non-indigenous foods that make up the bulk of our diet, right? All right, so I am also gonna use the term American uh, in the kind of vernacular to reference the United States, um, even though America technically is both North and South America and includes, you know, Mexico and, and Canada and Central America and all those places. Um, but I'm gonna be using it to refer primarily to the United States, just so everybody knows. Um, and so a lot of those indigenous foods that we just talked about are actually indigenous to South America, right? Um, potatoes in particular are indigenous to Peru. So they were actually introduced to North America by way of Europe. But the ones that are indigenous to North America, especially the Northeast, are ones that I think have become kind of very American foods. So, you know, it's like traditional New England foods, pumpkin, corn, and all the various dried corn products, cornbread, cornmeal mush, succotash, Johnny cake, stuff like that. Cranberries, turkey, maple syrup, and beans. So there were some uh, legumes that existed in Europe and the Middle East prior to the introduction of um, beans from the new world. So they have like lentils and peas and chickpeas. And then I think also lima beans, um, but pretty much everything else was introduced uh, from North and South America. So these are kind of like our quintessential American foods, right? So in early America, cooking was very different than how it is today, right? People primarily cooked over open hearths. We did not have stoves as we think of them in the 19th century yet. 
Um, meat was very seasonal. So if you heard, if you ever heard of spring chicken, like that's when you're culling your male chickens from the flock, right? Your non-laying chickens in the spring. Um, so that's when chicken was abundant. Otherwise, if you, if you weren't culling roosters, uh, you were waiting until your hen stopped laying to have a stewing hen, right? And then in the fall is when you, you harvested um, or butchered a lot of your larger meat animals, right? In part because you couldn't afford to keep them over the winter, you only kept your breeding animals through the winter because they were expensive to house and feed. Um, but also because that meat was what helped get you through the winter, right? And you can see in this image, they're kind of doing that, these women. This is probably from the 1830s or 40s. Um, so there's a ham hanging on the wall. There's a suckling pig, right? There's a brace of pheasants. It looks like the woman's cleaning a turkey. Um, so it's a mix of farm-raised and hunted meat, right? A lot of that meat was boiled, which doesn't actually mean um, it was boiled at 212 degrees, like what we would consider a rolling boil. Uh, that just meant that it was cooked in a liquid or spit roasted. So you can also see in this image, there's um, basically what's called a tin kitchen sitting in front of the fireplace and there's a stool and or a chair. And by the chair, you can maybe see there's a handle to turn the spit. So it's a tin oven with the kind of the shiny side and it's, and it's designed to reflect the heat to cook the meat. Um, your food was hyper local. If you were not raising it or growing it yourself, um, you were getting it from your neighbors. Everyone had a kitchen garden from the biggest estate to the lowliest hovel, right? Grist mills were also incredibly local. We tend to think of flour these days as like this staple that comes from who knows where and you just go to the grocery store and you buy it. But in early America, you were largely growing your own grain and you're getting it milled locally. Um, freshly milled flour is not very shelf stable. Um, it can go rancid quite quickly. I mean, most people used it up before it could go rancid, um, but whole grains are much more shelf stable. So the grist mill was going all the time. It's not like you went to harvest and then you processed all of your wheat into flour at once, right? You were going to be processing it kind of as you needed it. Um, and then even in cities, people kept livestock, they kept milch cows, they kept hogs. There is newspaper references from, you know, like the early, early 1800s complaining about all the hogs running through the cities like Philadelphia. <laughs> but that's also kind of your garbage pickup, right? Is you have these hogs that are eating the refuse that your, your kitchen scraps are throwing out. Um, and then of course your eating was also extremely seasonal. Uh, you were very much influenced by what you could get from your garden, what you could get uh, from the land if you lived in a more rural area um, or the sea if you lived on the coast. Um, and then you were very much bound by what you could preserve for would get you through the year. And if you calculated wrong or you had a poor harvest, uh, you're gonna be pretty hungry come springtime. So that's actually, I think a lot of what's going on in this image here, these women, you know, you can see there's this basket in the center of the room that's kind of overflowing with produce. There's potatoes on the floor, there's a cabbage. It looks like maybe there's an apple, some apples in the basket. Um, and then the woman has what looks like maybe a bowl of fruit, she's making a pie. You know, these are the sorts of things that people primarily preoccupied themselves with, right? Most people in early America, most of the labor they were doing uh, for the majority of people was towards food production. All right, so who was cooking? Um, for most in the United States until the Civil War, uh, that was an enslaved person, right? This kind of labor, cooking over an open hearth is extraordinarily labor intensive. Um, you have to maintain a fire, you have to haul firewood, you have to haul water, uh, your cookery um, appliances, I guess, for lack of a better term, are usually quite heavy. They're cast iron, they're brass, they're copper. Um, and it's just heavy, difficult work. So if you could afford to own someone as a white person, you usually did. And cooking was, was one of the primary, at least the hardest labor of cooking, was one of the primary things that people did. Um, much of Southern food 
is actually quite heavily influenced by West African foodways. Um, to a lesser extent, Northern cuisine is as well. Northern cuisine is a little bit more influenced by indigenous foodways, um, although American cuisine in general is a mix of indigenous African and European foods. Um, if you were in a very wealthy household, you might employ a French cook, or as in the case of Thomas Jefferson, a French trained enslaved cook like James Hemings. Uh, and here in New York, although we did have anti-slavery movements quite early and we had gradual manumission starting in 1799, um, the indenture laws meant that um, you could have an indentured African person until as late as the 1840s. There weren't very many of them after 1799, but it did continue to exist. Um, so yeah. And how are, is cooking knowledge transmitted in early America? A lot of that is through manuscript cookbooks. So this example is Martha Washington's manuscript cookbook, which in 1981 was transcribed by Karen Hess. Um, Martha wrote it for her daughter, Nellie Park Custis. And they're essentially handwritten books. Sometimes they're repurposed account books. Sometimes they're just little leather bound journals. Um, they're often not in any particular order. And they presume a lot of knowledge because essentially, you know, in a time when women died in childbirth quite frequently, uh, and when a woman's worth was often uh, judged by how well she ran a household, um, you know, passing on knowledge of how to run a household, how to cook, how to um, create hot home remedies for medical issues, uh, laundry, dyes, preserving food, all, all that kind of stuff that maybe you know you were worried you weren't going to be able to pass on manuscript cookbooks for a way that you could do that and some in some families manuscript cookbooks um were generational so you might have multiple generations writing in the same cookbook uh, in some communities they were communal so you might have your friends and neighbors giving you recipes that are written down in your manuscript cookbook um but the interesting thing about them is that they are largely specialty recipes right it's not necessarily how to boil beans or how to roast a haunch of whatever venison. Like every once in a while you will see those, but the vast majority of the recipes are for cake, for preserves and pickles, and for home remedies um, and household uh, recipes. Everything from like how to get wine stains out of linen to how to cure cancer, right? You know, those last ones weren't effective, but so yeah, that's, that's what a lot of women, how a lot of women were trained in early America was by experience and observation and through these manuscript cookbooks. Our first American cookbook is by Amelia Simmons, the American cook published in 1796. So obviously there were other cookbooks in the United States prior to 1796. A lot of British cookbooks obviously made their way over. Um, every once in a while, a French or a German one, mostly British though. Um, but hers was interesting because a lot of those European cookbooks were designed for large households and estates, wealthy aristocratic households with, you know, dozens of servants and huge estates that had to be managed. Um, this one was not. So it's basically written. Um, so it's, I'm not going to read the whole title, but you can see it. It's it's because it's kind of long. But at the very bottom, it says, or in the middle, it says, "Adapted to this country and all grades of life." So Amelia Simmons um, is writing this cookbook for households without slaves or servants, right? Which did exist, particularly uh, in the late uh, 1790s, right, when a lot of states were uh, contemplating manumission or had already implemented uh, anti-slavery laws. Right. The other interesting thing is that it was plagiarized quite heavily from other British cookbooks. And after it was published, it was very popular, but it was plagiarized by subsequent books, including one that basically just changed the title and the rest of it was the same. Um, so it's considered the first American cookbook for a couple of reasons. One is that it was actually published in the United States, right? First in Hartford, later in Albany. And also because it uses um, ingredients that are indigenous to America. It uses cornmeal, pumpkin, cranberries, turkey, those sorts of foods, which you don't usually find in European cookbooks. Um, it's also one of the first to call for the use of pearl ash. 
which is a chemical leavener that is a byproduct of the winemaking industry. And it's actually kind of like a precursor to baking soda. So prior to the use of these chemical leaveners, if you wanted your cake or your bread to be light, you had to use yeast or a lot of egg whites, <laughs> right? That's the only way you're gonna get um, light cakes and breads. But anyway, so she is considered the first American cookbook, right? Um, so as we're going into the 19th century, right? Amelia Simmons was published in 1796. And as we're going into the 19th century, um, we're also urbanizing and we're starting to buy foods from people we don't know. And that opens us up to adulteration. So Frederick Akeem is actually my only non-American author. And he's also not actually a cookbook author, but I thought it was important to include him uh, because of this issue of adulteration. So he's actually a German chemist. And in uh, 1820, he published the treatise on adulterations of food in London, right? So he published it in Great Britain, uh, which was more urban, like a lot of big European cities were much more urban than the United States at that time, although we were definitely getting there. Um, and so he used chemistry to expose adulteration of food. So adulteration of food is when you add any non-food ingredient into food in order to make it cheaper or to make it last longer or to make it look better, right? It's all, never to make it taste better. <laughs> um, so, you know, stuff like putting copper in pickles to make them more green or putting a plaster of Paris in flour to stretch it, right? Or putting a bluing in milk to make it look whiter. These are all things that were starting to happen at this time. Um, and so, the interesting thing about his book um, is that not only is it a reaction to the kind of the industrialization of food and increasing urbanization, right? Um, but he specifically says it's the housewife's job to be educated enough to be able to tell the difference between adulterated and non-adulterated foods. He does not call for any kind of government regulation. And in fact, it's not until the Food and Drug Act of 1906 in the United States that we actually get a government regulation of food adulteration that has any kind of teeth. So, you know, over 80 years later, which I think is interesting. So also in the 1820s, um, we have this fair lady, uh, Mary Randolph. This is an image of her from 1807. So she's a very interesting person. There's actually a lot of historians who have done a ton of research about her and her cookbook. Um, she's related to Thomas Jefferson by marriage, her husband, uh, worked in the Jefferson um, administration. And then she herself is, um, sorry, I got that backwards. She is related to Thomas Jefferson and her husband was related to the Custis Washingtons, right? Um, and she's also descended from John Rolfe and Pocahontas apparently. So Virginia royalty, that's where she lives is Virginia. Um, so her husband had worked for Thomas Jefferson when he was president and then when he lost the presidency, right, was no longer president, he lost his job. So she opened a boarding house um, to kind of help with the expenses and for them to make a living. And it's that's a very common thing for women to do throughout the 19th century. If your husband is unemployed or ill or disabled or you're a widow and you own your own house, opening a boarding house where you take in lodgers um, and usually feed them was a way for you to make a living, right? Uh, and then in 1824, she published The Virginia Housewife, a cookbook. Um, sadly, she dies in 1828, so only four years after the cookbook was published. Interestingly, she's buried at Arlington House, which is the home of George Washington Park Custis, uh, and later the site of Arlington Cemetery. So she's like the first person buried at Arlington Cemetery, which is kind of cool. But her book, The Virginia Housewife, The Methodical Cook, is hugely influential um, in American cookbook history. A lot of subsequent cookbooks refer back to it, including I found out recently um, Melinda Russell's 1866 domestic cook cookbook, which is considered the first um, American cookbook published by an African American uh, by Melinda Russell in 1866. And I'm not gonna go super into it because I just did a blog post about it. <laughs> You can go read about it, but she references the Virginia housewife in the introduction to her cookbook. So it's such a fascinating book because um, 
it's not what you think of as like stereotypical 19th century Southern cooking, right? Some of those recipes are in there, but there's a lot of Spanish recipes. There's a lot of French recipes, which some people actually think may have been influenced by James Hemings, um, Thomas Jefferson's enslaved cook, right? She may have encountered a lot of French recipes in the Jefferson household because of that. But it's also got a ton of vegetable recipes, which is kind of unusual. And that's one of the main differences between published cookbooks and manuscript cookbooks is published cookbooks tend to be more um, holistic, more complete, right? They give you recipes for like basic stuff, which a lot of cooks probably already know. But a lot of cookbooks, A, you want to have a lot of recipes because that means more value, right? And B, they were also sort of training people who maybe didn't know these things or maybe didn't have the benefit of being raised in a household with that style of cooking. Um, so I find that kind of an interesting dichotomy. So hers, there's a ton of vegetables, including tomatoes, which are still fairly controversial in 1824. Like not a lot of people were cooking with them yet. Um, and she mentions specifically how well suited they are to the Southern climate, right? That it's very hot down there. And as we know in tomatoes, like heat and sun. So anyway, so she and she is really part of this movement in the 19th century that I call the art of home cookery, which is why that's on the top that cooking and keeping a household is a domestic art um, that takes practice, but also artistry, right? There's a lot of emphasis on the taste of the food. There's some emphasis on um, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The presentation of the food. Um, and that changes as we get into the 20th century. So that's why I'm making this distinction. Another very interesting uh, home cook is Lydia Maria Child, right? So she's most famous actually for her poem Over the River and Through the Wood, which is also known as the New England so Boys Song of Thanksgiving. Um, and she wrote The American Frugal Housewife, which was actually published in 1829 as The Frugal Housewife. And then in 1832, an edition was published in London, but there was already a British edition of called The Frugal Housewife. So she changed the name to The American Frugal Housewife. Um, but she was also a very quite fervent um, abolitionist and Native American rights activist. She's actually a novelist and one of her first um, books has a white woman marrying an indigenous man. And that was very controversial at the time. Um, and as she got involved in abolition after the publication of her cookbook, she actually underwent a ton of censure. She was the editor of the Juvenile Miscellany, um, which was like a children's uh, literary magazine, which was like basically the first one in the United States. And she actually left her position there because they lost so many subscribers because of her abolitionist beliefs. Um, that she felt it was not fair to the magazine for her to stay on as editor. So she just publishes the one cookbook, but again, like um, Amelia Simmons, her cookbook is for ordinary women who don't have servants or slaves, right? Although she's from New England, so, and she's an abolitionist, so she's probably not gonna bring that up. So it's very like plain, basic cooking, um, but I included her because she just has this really interesting background. And despite her abolitionist tendencies, this is a cookbook that really kind of persists because it's one of the earliest ones. Um, and because it's got this sort of broader national appeal, right? It's the American frugal housewife, not the Massachusetts or New York or Connecticut frugal housewife, right? Unlike Mary Randolph and the Virginia housewife. Um, so another woman who kind of adopts a sort of more American, broader national style in her cookbooks is Catherine Beecher. She's the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe, right? Firm believer of female education. In 1823, she opens the Hartford Female Seminary, which is basically higher education for women. Uh, she was an advocate of Sylvester Graham, who was a health reformer. If you've heard of Graham Flower or Graham Crackers, they are named after him. He would probably be appalled at graham crackers because um, he was very much like whole grains, no sugar, asceticism, diet kind of thinker. Um, but she was an advocate of his. She interestingly opposes the Indian Removal Bill, which is happening in the 1830s under uh, Andrew Jackson. But she's an anti-suffragist. So she does not believe that women need the right to vote. And that informs her cookbook writing, right? So you might think to yourself, well, 
what the heck? How come this woman who's in such favor of female education, anti-suffragist? And a lot of that has to do with this idea of Republican motherhood, right? So women need to be educated so they can educate their sons and that their sons can go out and influence the world. But a woman's home is the domestic sphere. She should have control of that sphere, you know, to the point where in, by the Victorian period, it's like men were guests in their women's homes, right? Um, but that is what informs her anti-suffragism, which I find very interesting. So she publishes a number of cookbooks and domestic manuals. Um, the most famous one she publishes with her sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who ironically was pro-women suffrage. So it's interesting little family squabble there. Um, so the American Women's Home, published after the Civil War, is really like a domestic household manual. So it includes food recipes, but it also includes a ton of advice on how to manage your home, right? So she had published a receipt or recipe book earlier. Um, she'd done, you know, kind of like a textbook for young women, the treatise on domestic economy for these young ladies at the home and at school. But the American Women's Home was really designed as, um, you know, a home manual, not just a cookbook, which is kind of an interesting trend that continues throughout the 19th century. All right, so now we're after the Civil War. Who's cooking after the Civil War? Um, so obviously slavery continues in the South until the Civil War and then there's emancipation afterwards, although for most formerly enslaved people that came with nothing, uh, right? You did not get your 40 acres in a mule, you're just like, okay, you're free now, you can stay on the plantation and we'll pay you a pittance uh, or you can leave was basically the options offered to those people. So a lot of formerly enslaved people did emigrate north. There were also a large number of free people uh, in the north, who free black people who often worked in service industries, right? Um, so post-Civil War, if you could afford one, you had at least one female servant, right? So usually like kind of like a maid of all work. Um, and then of course, wealthier has households, you can afford a housekeeper and a cook, right? And then free black women and widowed white women often started catering businesses or tea rooms. So we're expanding beyond just the boarding house. Um, you could start a catering business, which is increasingly popular for people who did home entertaining. Right, especially in cities where maybe you didn't want to have a large domestic staff because you couldn't afford to keep them. But if you wanted to have a party, you might hire a caterer to come in and do the cooking. Um, and tea rooms, people were starting to eat in public a lot more. And tea rooms were considered, you know, safe for women to go to. Women did not really go to restaurants really until the late 19th century. Uh, that was a male thing, unless you were traveling. You didn't really, or like at a, a hotel resort or something, you might eat at the hotel. Um, but people did not go out to restaurants. You mostly ate at home or in someone else's home. And um, again, if you want to know more about Anne Northup, I did just do a blog post about her. But uh, Solomon Northup's wife, Anne, was a free Black woman who was a professional cook in Saratoga, which is a very fashionable spa uh, region in, from like the 1840s until the 1850s. Um, and Solomon Northup uh, was a musician by trade, but the work was very seasonal, right, in Saratoga because you have all the tourists coming in the summer and then in the winter there's not as much going on. So he got an offer of a job as a violinist, that's when he was a violinist, in Virginia. So he traveled to Virginia um, to take this job and he was captured, kidnapped, and uh, basically sold into slavery and ended up working on a Louisiana sugar plantation, which um, sugar plantations are some of the most brutal forms of agricultural slavery, forced labor that there are. Uh, and he was there for 12 years. So while he was enslaved for 12 years, his wife Anne continued to work at a cook as a cook. She worked at the Morris Jamal Mansion in New York City, which is where I was first introduced to her. Um, so she's just one example of how a lot of women, black and white, but especially free black women, uh, use their cooking skills to support themselves and their families um, when their husbands either were denied more lucrative jobs or in the case of Anne, when they were kidnapped and sold into slavery. So 
All right, so there are some other cookbooks from this time period, you know, pre-Civil War that kind of fall into this art of home cookery. Uh, and unlike uh, Catherine Beecher and Lydia, Lydia Maria Child, they are not broadly American, right? They're very specific, which I find interesting. My favorite actually is Everybody's Cook and Receipt Book, designed for Buckeyes, Hoosiers, Wolverines, Corn Crackers, Suckers, etc., by Philomelia Hardin in 1842. I just think that's the best title ever because she says it's for everybody but then she's very specific about who it's for. And these are all nicknames of states in the old Northwest. So Buckeyes are Ohio, Hoosiers are Indiana. Wolverines, I think somebody told me is Michigan. And somebody looked up corn crackers last time I did this talk and I don't remember, I need to write it down. Um, but so basically it's like old Northwest region, right? Um, and then Western housewifery is talking about the actual West, right? So, um, these are very representative of the regionalism in American cooking at this time. And it's a regionalism that after the Civil War starts to decline. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, so we're kind of going from our hyper local groceries with limited imports, right? I talked about even staples are produced locally. Um, you do also have regional cuisines that are influenced by immigrants, right? But Oops, there's a couple of things that start to change that. So we had, we had talked about um, regionality in American food ways and how that started to change in the mid 19th century. And so a big influencer on that was women's magazines. Um, I was talking a little bit about Sarah Josepha Hale, who you can see is the editor of the Godey's Ladies book. That was one of the biggest in the mid-century. Um, if you've read Laura Ingalls Wilder, it's mentioned in one of her books. Uh, and Sarah Josepha Hale actually had also taken over as editor of the Juvenile Miscellany from Lydia Maria Child. So um, a lot of these, these magazines included recipes as a regular uh, function. Um, you also had recipes and you started to get like advice columns and stuff in all kinds of newspapers and other um, other publications, right? And so that has this effect of starting to homogenize American food simply because a lot of the re recipes are no longer regional, right? So if you're subscribing to a national magazine like Godey's Ladies Book, you're going to be getting recipes that are considered to be more national. Even though a lot of these um, magazines were published in the Northeast, so that tends to have an influence. Not all of them where you do get some Midwestern ones, um, particularly in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, but you start to get more and more of the same recipes being shared across the country. So everybody starts to be interested in lemon pie. Everybody starts to be interested in lobster Newburgh, right? Because these are considered fashionable foods. And so they start to be adopted regardless of what the cuisine is locally. All right, so can you go to the next slide, please? So there are a couple of other influences on the homogenization of American food. The biggest one is the rise of railroads. So in the 1840s, Cincinnati, Ohio was actually known as Porkopolis because of the pork packing and pork slaughtering industry there. Um, and then later in the century, you get Chicago becomes the center of meat packing because you get Texas Longhorn beef uh, driven on those cattle drives right up to Kansas City where those cattle are then loaded on railroad cars and shipped to Chicago for slaughter. Um, you also, because of the railroad, start to get the rise in cash cropping. So previously, you know, if you're growing these foods that are very easy to grow in your region, everybody is probably growing them. And so it's all being consumed locally. There's not a huge market outside of your, your own home, right? But with railroads, all of a sudden, you have access to markets where oranges don't grow, where peaches don't grow, where cherries don't grow, where lettuce and young vegetables don't grow or are difficult to grow. So you start to get specialization in agriculture um, because you can make money doing it, right? You can access these markets that were not previously available to you. But because of that, that starts to influence the regionality of the, the foodstuffs that are available to you, 
right? So you do still, obviously, peaches are still a big thing in Georgia, but I've found references of, like, housewives in North Dakota shipping flats of Georgia peaches in in season because they're so cheap and then home canning peaches, right? And you're not buying commercially canned peaches because that's expensive. You're home canning them, but that's facilitated by railroads. You also get a rise in urbanization. So this is kind of the trend throughout the 19th century and really the trend into the 20th and 21st century too, right? People are concentrating more and more in cities. Um, and because of that, you're more and more divorced from food production. You're not producing your own food. Um, and so you're being exposed to a lot of other um, foods from around the country. You might be exposed to more diversity of food ways. So you're not staying in one place and cooking the same food way for centuries like they did in Europe and other places around the world. Uh, there's a rise in commercially canned goods. After World War, sorry, after the Civil War, <laughs> um, and you have the rise in brand name goods. So I have a couple lists here, you know, Campbell, Heinz, Kellogg, all very familiar. Those all start in the 1870s to the 1890s. Um, my favorite is You Need a Biscuit, because I just think that's the best name. Um, and it's, I like to talk about this because this is a good example of why brand names start to become so popular. So. I put you need a biscuit versus the Cracker Barrel on here because prior to brand names, if you wanted crackers or biscuits, savory or sweet, um, they just came in a barrel, right? They were baked wherever, packed in a barrel and shipped off to your local general store where they were sold by weight. So you didn't really know where they came from. They might be local, they might not. Sometimes they were mixed flavors. Um, a lot of crackers were like, you know, pilot crackers are hardtack. Um, and if you had a scrupulous, you know, general store owner, awesome. You know, you knew that the product would probably be good. They wouldn't cheat you, whatever. But if you were at the mercy of kind of an unscrupulous one, um, who was probably buying the cheapest of that they could get, uh, you know, the crackers might be broken. They might be stale. They might be damp, right? Maybe there's been mice in them. You don't really know because you're not allowed to choose for yourself at this time. A clerk selects everything for you. You just request it. So you need a biscuit was prepackaged. Um, it was consistent. It was less likely to be broken, right? The brand name, you knew where it was from, where it was made. Uh, and that's kind of why brand name foods become so popular at the end of the 19th century, if you can afford them, because they are more expensive. But they offer consistency, and people start to trust them, right? So it's not just necessarily quality, although with Heinz in particular, um, quality was definitely a thing. And it's not just uh, novelty, which was definitely a thing with Kellogg, you know, the first really to do packaged breakfast, breakfast cereals. Um, a lot of it has to do with consistent consistency of quality and you know what you're going to get, right? It's not necessarily better than what's produced locally, but you, it's a known quantity. It's not a surprise. All right, if you get to the next one. All right, so now we're getting into the very late 19th century, and we start to get the development of what I call celebrity cooks. Um, really, the first one is a woman named Mariah Parloa, or Maria Parloa, uh, she has such a fascinating background. So she's orphaned at a young age. She ends up working as a cook in hotels and boarding houses. She ends up in Florida to go to normal school, which is like a teacher's college. Um, and she's teaching Sunday school on Sundays and decides as a fundraiser for her church, she's going to teach a cooking class, you know, because she has all this cooking background. And it's, like, it's so popular and raised so much money for her church that she decides, oh, I'm not going to be a regular teacher. I'm going to be a cooking teacher, and she moves back to Boston, she's from the Northeast originally, and opens a school of cooking in 1877, which is very popular. Um, she ends up moving to New York City and opening a cooking school there. And then um, in 1877, she just retires from teaching and writes full time. So in the 1890s, she actually becomes one of the first cookbook authors to endorse products and to create recipes for uh, specific companies. So if you go to the next slide, we'll see some of her cookbooks. 
So as you can see, she's a very prolific cookbook author. So she's writing um, between 1872 is her first one. Actually, before she opens her, her cooking school, she writes the Appledore cookbook. Um, and her last one is actually published um, posthumously uh, about how to can fruit in 1917 because she dies in 1909. Um, but she, again, this kind of trend of American cookbook authors, you know, over the decades is how do I teach ordinary people how to cook well and how to operate their household well? So her, oh, you know, she's got a couple of textbooks. Um, one that I find interesting is Ms. Perlowa's new cookbook, A Guide to Marketing and Cooking. So marketing is shopping, grocery shopping. Um, so it's teaching people how to do it. She also has a young housekeeper book on there, right? If you're newly married, and this is a trend that happens more in the 20th century, which we'll get to, but, you know, how, how to keep a household. Um, and then they're not on here, but Maria Parlo and a couple of our next couple of um, cookbook authors are among our first of, you know, the cooks who endorse the products. She's really the very first, but a couple of the subsequent ones are as well. And all three of the next Two ladies I'm going to talk about with Maria Parloa um, were all hired by Codeline, which is a vegetable shortening company. And um, I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, another food historian, Helen Zobite, has actually done a whole thing on Crisco versus Codeline and how vegetable oil is actually cottonseed oil. And the reason why Crisco is still around is because they kind of concealed the fact that it's made from cottonseed oil. I don't know if it is anymore, but at the time it was. Um, but their rival, Cotyline, obviously was very upfront about the fact that it's made from cottonseed oil. And they had a ton of corporate cookbooks, which we'll get talk more about later. Um, but a number of their ones from the 1890s had Maria Parloa and two of our subsequent cooks, which we're going to talk about. So um, if you want to just flip through the next couple of slides, Giovanna, there's just pictures of her cookbooks. Um, yep. All right. So our other early celebrity cook is uh, Sarah Tyson Rohr, who is quite interesting because she um, is actually learns cooking at a cooking school, which I find fascinating. So it's not just happenstance that she learns how to cook, right? She specifically goes to cooking school in Philadelphia and then opens her own cooking school in Philadelphia, which I'm sure didn't make the school that trained her very happy. Um, and she also has kind of her claim to fame, which is, true of a lot of these kind of celebrity cooks that we're going to be talking about is she manages food pavilions at like these world fairs. So hers is the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904, made famous by the movie Meet Me in St. Louis with, with uh, Judy Garland. Um, but being able to say that you have this background, that you've won prizes, that you've, you know, managed these pavilions at these big, um, expositions and fairs and things like that. That was a way of claiming some authority of your expertise, right? So it's not just that you're a good home cook, you're a professional cook, you're a cooking teacher, right? So you're claiming that kind of authority. She also wrote for the Ladies Home Journal and Good Housekeeping. And at the time, she was pretty much one of the most, if not the most famous cooking teacher at her time. The sad thing is, is that she lost everything in the Great Depression. Um, she dies in 1937, basically impoverished and alone, which is a really sad end to her. But um, if you go to the next slide, Giovanna, you can see that she left a, another prolific catalog of cookbooks. So most of these are her cookbook, you know, originally her cookbooks, um, but she did also do a ton of corporate cookbook. So like I said, she wrote for Cotyline with Maria Parloa. Um, and she also, which I like saw it on Etsy recently and I didn't get it because it was like $90. But she wrote a vegetable cookbook for Burpee Seed Company. And it's huge. It's like this giant hardbound cookbook. And if you ordered their seeds, you could like write to them and they would send you this enormous cookbook. It is digitized, which is another reason why I didn't buy the original one. Um, but so she and Maria Parloa are kind of leveraging their expertise to really make a living. Um, I don't think either of them got married, or if they did, they were widowed of their husbands, you know, like they didn't have kids, right? So 
So they were really career women at a time when this was kind of the only avenue open to them, right, to have a career. All right, so if you want to flip through the next couple, or the next one is just uh, images of her cookbooks, and then if you go to the next slide, we'll get to our third celebrity cook who was hired by Cotillion, which is Mary Lincoln. So um, Mary Lincoln was a homemaker, not it's Mary Johnson Bailey Lincoln, not Mary Todd Lincoln, right? Uh, Mary Lincoln was a homemaker who ends up at the Boston King School as an instructor. So, but what pushes her into cooking school is her husband was ill and couldn't work. And so she actually goes into domestic service, right? She becomes a servant. Um, and so she gains this expertise in household management, and she becomes one of the first teachers at the Boston Cooking School. And I find it interesting that she was in invited when they first opened, and she says no. And then she trains under the two instructors that they do hire, one of which is Maria Perloa. And then she, then once she is trained with them, then she becomes a teacher. And then later she's the first principal of the school. So she is a super influential cookbook author because she integrates chemistry and nutrition science into her cookbooks, like kind of explaining things for the average housewife, you know, why stuff works. She uses that. So if you go to the next slide. So she's not quite as prolific a cookbook author. Um, her most famous one is her first, which is Mrs. Mrs. Lincoln's Boston Cookbook, What to Do and What Not to Do in Cooking, right? Very descriptive title. Um, and she does a textbook, but what I find very interesting is um, she kind of hops on the bandwagon with trends a little bit. So uh, in 1886, and then again in 1901, she publishes um, the Peerless Cookbook. And I find it interesting that the 1901 edition says new and enlarged edition with recipes for the chafing dish. So chafing dish is kind of like if you've ever gone to like a catering event and you've seen like the hotel pans with the sterno flame under it, it's like a household version of that, and but without the water bath. So instead of just keeping food hot, you're like cooking right on this little table side, you know, griddle basically. Um, and it was very fashionable in the 1880s, and then it kind of had a revival in the early 1900s. Um, and then again, like in the 1920s, I kind of like every every 10 or 15 years, it kind of came back around in fashion. So I find it interesting that she's kind of jumping on that bandwagon. And then if you look at the last one on here, um, she publishes in 1907, The Pure Food Cookbook. And remember when we were talking about Frederick Acume and food adulteration, and I said it wasn't until the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 that we actually get food regulation. <laughs> so she is totally capitalizing on that with her Pure Food Cookbook that comes out just a year after the Pure Food and Drug Act, which I find very interesting. Okay, so you can, the next slide is just a couple pictures of her cookbooks, and then we'll go to one you probably actually recognize, right? Fanny Farmer, who is, probably has the most enduring fame of any of the turn of the century cookbook authors. She's known as the mother of level measurements, so here she is with a measuring cup, right? And that is because, so, Throughout the 19th century, measurements are kind of individualized in cooking. Like, if you know a lot about um, historic cookbooks, it would be like, oh, butter the size of an egg, or a cup of milk, but it's not a standard cup, or a dessert spoon, or a wine glass. So these things that are kind of standardized, but not officially standardized, right? And if you were a cook, you're going to use the same cup every time as your measuring cup, right? Because that's, you can kind of figure it out with your own trial and error. But Fanny Farmer really takes um, some of the commercially available measuring tools and says, you know, her thesis is a lot of the reason why people are bad cooks is because they don't follow recipes exactly, which, newsflash, people still do all the time, right? <laughs> so her thesis is if you follow my recipe exactly, it will come out perfectly every time. And so she... That's the kind of the, the influence she has with her cookbooks is she tests them. She writes them to be very clear. They're very complete. They're very organized, which is not the case for a lot of cookbooks at the time. Um, and that's how she gets 
the moniker mother of level measurements because you just want a heaping cup of flour. You put your flour in them, then you take a knife and you level it off, right? That's how you know it's accurate. So she actually starts as a student at the Boston Cooking School uh, and then later becomes principal. She is trained by Mary Lincoln. Uh, she leaves and opens her own school of cookery. And this is a very interesting thing about her. So the last seven years of her life, she is a wheelchair user. And she becomes very interested in invalid cookery. And I think the reason why she's a wheelchair user is that when she was a teen, she had a paralyzing illness. Um, could have been something like Guillain Barr, right? So she recovered, but she didn't ever fully recover. And then later in life, um, she had to use a wheelchair. That's why pretty much all the pictures you see of her, she's seated, right? So she becomes interested in invalid cookery, which is the Victorian turn of the 20th century word for basically or sometimes you'll see it's sick room cookery, right? So it's for food for sick people, which there were very distinct ideas about what ill people should eat that were very different than what non-sick people ate, right? So she becomes such an expert in this that she's actually invited to lecture at Harvard Medical College um, about invalid cookery and, and, you know, assisting sick people. All right, so you can go to the next slide. Okay, so again, not quite as prolific as some of her predecessors, but still lots of cookbooks. She also hops on the chafing dish bandwagon, <laughs> which I find fun. Um, she has got a food and cookery for the sick and convalescent. But her most famous one, obviously, is the Boston Cooking School book, which was first published in 1896. And I actually have a facsimile edition in my collection, and there's handwritten corrections in the facsimile, which I love, so like the bunch of printer errors that Fanny was like, no, these need to be corrected. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you will see the two editions, an original one and then a later edition um, with a forward by James Beard. I think there are seven different editions throughout. Um, and you may have cooked from Fanny Farmer. All right, so yes, you can go to the next slide. Thanks, Yvonne. So um, Ellen Richards is not really a cookbook author. She kind of is, but I thought she was important to include because of the impact she has on cookbooks. So Ellen Smaller Richards is known as the mother of home, home, home economics. Wow, if I can spit it out. Um, she's one of the first women to study chemistry at MIT. She actually attended Vassar as an undergrad uh, and wanted to go into astronomy, but thought that there would be more career opportunities for her if she went into chemistry, so that's what she did. Um, and she was right, there were way more career opportunities for her as a chemist because you can apply chemistry to the domestic arts, right? So that's how women were kind of pigeonholed uh, in the, at the turn of the 20th century. And for a long time after, if you wanted to do academic science, um, you were kind of forced into these avenues having to do with the domestic sphere. So she does have a couple of forays into, um, you know, public kitchen management and cooking. The first one is in 1890. She founds the New England School of Boston with Barry Hinman Abel, which was a charitable kitchen that was designed to provide um, inexpensive, nutritious food for working families. But that's like code for let's Americanize the immigrants, right? So there's a very traditional New England style food that was supposed to be inexpensive to teach the ignorant immigrants how to cook properly, kind of, right? And so the funny thing is, is that the immigrants were not having it. So like, we don't want beef tea and, you know, blanc mange and your sad Indian meal pudding. <laughs> They're like, we want our yummy food from back home that connects us to our heritage. So the people they end up serving were like serving clerks and shop girls and, you know, poor bank clerks and stuff, not the deserving poor, right? They're ending up serving young people who live in garrets and don't know how to cook. So the kitchen closes, it's not really a success. Um, but she does leverage her expertise in 1893 to manage the Rumford Baking Powder Kitchen at the Columbia, World, World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, um, which is a big deal. So if you switch to the next slide you will see that most of her book publications are actually not cookbooks. She does write about adulteration. 
She writes um, plain words about food, the Rumford Kitchen Leaflets in 1899. So that's again a partnership with Rumford Baking Powder. But most of her other publications are basically academic treatises that only happen to do with food um, and the domestic sphere. Right, so if you click through the next one, there's a couple images of her cookbooks. And then we get to domestic science versus home economics. So this is the tension that's happening at the turn of the 20th century. So in the 1890s, 1900s, we're starting to get more research into nutrition science. So the conventional wisdom of nutrition science at the time was that fat, carbohydrates, and protein existed. And that was the only thing that mattered. And because of that, milk was the perfect food, right? Because it contains all three. And vegetables in provide important fiber. So you don't get constipated, but otherwise they're nutritionally worthless because they're just water and fiber. Well, then we started discovering some stuff about vitamins, right? But a lot of vitamin discoveries did not occur until the 1920s. So when Ellen Richards and all these other cookbook authors uh, were writing, the fat, carbohydrates, protein was the conventional wisdom. We also start um, applying calories to human consumption. So calorie is a measure of heat energy uh, that was invented in the 1830s to measure the heat energy of steam engines. But in the 1890s, Wilbro Atwater um, starts applying it to humans to calculate how humans uh, process food into the energy that we need to live, right? So that becomes part of the nutrition lexicon. But the main tension between this new nutrition science and what's called domestic science, which is a term that Ellen Swallow just hated, uh, was this tension, same tension between science and art. So remember in the early part of the 19th century, I called it the art of home cookery. Right now in the 20th century, we're much more concerned about science. And there's also tension between self-taught cooks and university educated home economists, right? And I put domestic science versus home economics because there was also a stigma with the term domestic, right? Which is part of why Ellen Swallow Richards hated it. So a lot of the cooking schools were actually designed for people working in service, right? You're a housekeeper, uh, you are a professional cook, you run a catering business, you run a tea room. They were not designed for women who were stay-at-home housewives running households, right? They were designed for women who were working for a living, which had a lot of stigma attached to it for, you know, wealthier, upper middle class, educated white women. So that's part of the dichotomy between these two. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, um, there's a very influential event. In 1899, we get the Lake Placid Conference. Lake Placid Conference is an annual conference um, held by uh, Melville Dewey of Dewey Decimal Fame and his wife. Uh, and in 1899, they decided to host their meeting. They had a different theme every year. And in 1899, their theme was home science and household economics. Uh, there were only 11 people who attended the first one. Among them were Ellen Paul Richards, Maria Parlow, and some other uh, women influential in domestic science, um, women who were running cooking schools, women who are working in universities. Uh, and that is where the term home economics is coined, which I'm sure Ellen Swallow Richards was super happy about because, like I said, she hated the term domestic science. Um, so they continue to meet annually on this topic. In 1908, they formed the American Home Economics Association, which is under a different name, but is still around. Uh, in 1909, Ellen Swallow Richards founds and publishes the Journal of Home Economics, which, again, different name, still around. So she gets to see that published before she dies in 1911, which is great. And if you go to the next slide, there's a picture. I literally like squealed when I found this picture in the Cornell archives. Um, so the woman in the middle is Ellis Wall Richards. And the woman in the rocking chair on the right-hand side with the cameo is Maria Parlova. So I just love that there's this picture. All right, so that's our home economics story, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, and the reason why home economics is so important uh, is that it starts to have a big impact on cookbooks in the 20th century. So in the 20th century, you know, turn of the 20th century, we have a rising middle class. 
there's a simultaneous decline in household help, right? So why would you be a 24 hour a day servant, maybe making not super great wages uh, when you could be a 10 or 14 hour a day shop girl or a factory worker making pretty good wages and having free time, right? So um, you start to get a decline in household help. And because of that, women who didn't grow up cooking and who maybe can run a household but not do a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff start to rely more and more on convenience foods, right? Canned goods are convenience foods. Um, and a lot of convenience food also takes the labor out of what were previously very labor intensive and therefore expensive foods. So for instance, Jell-O, before the introduction of Jell-O or Knox gelatin or any other powdered granulated gelatin, if you wanted to make gelatin, you had to boil calf's feet for hours and strain the, <laughs> the broth and then chill it and then flavor it. You know, it's very labor intensive. Same with um, Campbell's soup, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, same thing, you had Campbell's soup, their very first soups are um, beef consomme, and then like the cream soups, like pureed soups, like tomato soup, they're pureed tomato soup. Before Campbell's, if you know, we didn't have blenders at this time, if you wanted a cream soup, you had to press it through a sieve manually. <laughs> Just very labor intensive. Or if you want beef consomme, that again is a very labor intensive uh, operation. You have to clarify the stock, right? Because you want it perfectly clear beef soup. So a lot of these corporate um, food production companies start leveraging the interest in their food um, and start trying to leverage. Uh, and expand their audience by publishing recipe pamphlets and cookbooks. And they did that by hiring home economists. Because let's use Campbell's, for example. There's a finite amount of soup that the average person is going to consume on a daily basis in the United States, right? If you're lucky, they're having soup once a day. If you're not lucky, they're having it once a week or once a month, right? So how do you expand your customer base? You figure out other uses for your product. And that's where the home economists come in. That's where the celebrity cooks come in. Um, they're thinking up new ways to use these products to increase demand for a product that might not otherwise have very high demand, right? Okay, you can go to the next one. So we had talked a little bit about, as we're going along, you know, a lot of these cookbook authors are publishing, you know, like young ladies guides and, you know, young women's household management. And at this time, in the turn of the 20th century, into the Roaring Twenties especially, um, you start to get the trend of the Young Bride cookbook. And a lot of that has to do with the Edwardian era and the Roaring Twenties. You get like clueless brides, right? So these are middle class women who are raised to be housewives, but aren't really trained to be housewives. They maybe grew up with servants. They probably went to high school. Some of them went to college. They did not get household management training from their mothers. They did not get it in school. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's Sally is married to young Johnny, who's the assistant vice president of whatever at her dad's bank, and probably isn't making a lot of money. And they buy their little teeny apartment in New York City. And she has to figure out how to operate a budget, how to cook, how to entertain, she maybe doesn't know anything about money management. Um, so you get the proliferation of a lot of these cookbooks uh, designed to teach women all these things that nobody teaches them. So if you go to the next slide, there's a very good example of this. And I think it's hilarious, so I'm going to read it. This is an advertisement from the 1930s for Spry vegetable shortening. Spry is actually starts out as a lard company and then shifts in the 19 teens and 20s to vegetable shortening. So this is, they have hundreds of these advertisements. So it's, this is a young woman, and she says, your cookbook is the grandest wedding gift, Aunt Jenny. And Aunt Jenny says, and here is a big three-pound can of Spry to start you off housekeeping. It'll keep fresh and creamy right on the shelf. A week later, I'm proud of my Spry cake. 
so light and delicate and velvety, and it makes it jiffy. Spry is so wonderfully creamy. I just love to use it. The next evening. Marvelous fritters, darling, so crisp and tender. And Spry doesn't smoke or smell up the house. Boy, isn't this pie crust tender and flaky. You're a grand little cook. Thank Aunt Jenny and Spry. It'll save lots on our food budget, too. So thank you for letting me read that in my voices because I think it's hilarious. So that, that's an example of a young clueless bride who doesn't know what she's doing, getting advice from Aunt Jenny, right? Not her mom, older Aunt Jenny, probably maybe a great aunt, right? Who's using Spry, right? It's a brand um, endorsement, right? But she's it's with this um, this kind of conceit of training a bride and what's the best way to cook food, you know, what's the best products to use. And so Spry is saying that they're that product. And like I said, there's there's hundreds of these different advertisements available. All right, so let's just pop to the next slide. I did just want to bring up a little bit the great work because that's like my special area of expertise. Um, so World War One doesn't have a huge influence on cookbooks but it does have some influence on cookbooks. Um, so the United States is in the war for sh such a short amount of time. We only joined in the spring of 1917 and then the fall of 1918, it's done, right? So like a year and a half. So we can't crank out that many cookbooks, but we do crank out quite a few. Um, and it's kind of a pivotal time because it's really the first time that the federal government and state governments are really, um, regulating food and regulating food markets on a very wide scale. So we don't have mandatory rationing for regular ordinary Americans. It's all voluntary. But we do have a lot of regulation of food business. So like hotels, railroads, um, you know, all these places where you have public dining were very tightly regulated by the government. And if you did not conform to the regulations, they would take away your license and shut you down which not everybody knows about. Um, but a lot of the food rhetoric in World War I was around food conservation um, and rationing to free up various foods for us to send to the Allies. So our agriculture is not super technologically advanced at this time. We basically only produce enough food um, for use inside the country. If we have a particularly good year, you might have some for export, but most of it is domestic production. So all of a sudden when we enter the war, um, there's big demand from Europe for our food products, which like drives prices up and then causes scarcity at home. So a lot of the rhetoric around World War One is about eating other foods to free up desired foods like butter, lard, meat, sugar, and wheat for shipment overseas and to feed our troops. Um, so you get a big emphasis on food conservation. So there's this great poster. Um, it's, you know, it's Columbia, symbol of America. And she's got fresh fruits and vegetables on her scale, weighing in balance with preserved fruits and vegetables. And then there's like the line of housewives behind her. I love it. Um, so there was an emphasis on war gardens, right? Which are the ancestors of victory gardens, which is actually a term that comes out after uh, the end of the war, right? Because it's we won World War I, so now our war gardens are turned into victory gardens. You get community canning kitchens. And a lot of the rationing and the food preservation aspects of World War I are reflected in the cookbooks. And you do see a couple of recipes, particular recipes, like a war cake recipe, which is like a boiled raisin spice cake. Um, that persists after you see that in community cookbooks and published cookbooks, you know, really until the 1960s, you see reference to that. So, okay, we can go to the next slide. Just quickly, I love these are, um, two pamphlets from the National War Garden Commission, which is a private organization that encouraged war gardening and food preservation. And this is the Victory Edition, like I said, 1919, that's when the term Victory Garden comes around. Uh, and I love the one on the right. So it's the Home Canning and Drying of Fruits and Vegetables little pamphlet. And it's, this is also a propaganda poster, but it says, can fruit, vegetables, fruit, and the Kaiser too. So <laughs> it's Kaiser Wilhelm with his little German helmet and his sword, and then it says Kaiser brand unsweetened is the label on the can, which I think is hilarious. So I thought I would share. All right, you can go to the next one. <laughs> All 
All right, so now we're post World War One. We're into the 1920s, um, and this woman you may have heard of. She is actually super influential um, until the 1970s. Really, her name is Ida B- Bailey Allen, uh, and she starts out as food editor of the Sunday New York American, which is a newspaper. Um, and in 1928, she becomes a radio personality. So we have this great image of her in her kitchen with her little radio microphone. And she does a lot of really incredible things with radio. So first of all, she pioneers spot advertising on radio. So rather than saying, oh, today's radio show is sponsored by blah, 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 they just do the radio show. And then, like, if they're baking a cake, they're like, we're going to bake a cake, and now we're going to use Davis baking powder. Davis baking powder is blah, 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 you know. She pioneers that. She's the first one to do it in radio, which is pretty cool. Um, She becomes the founder and president of the National Radio Homemakers Club, which radio homemaking was a huge thing from the late 1920s until after World War II. Right? So you had all these homemaker shows on the radio. So you're kind of shifting away from our 19th century periodicals and newspapers, although that does continue. Um, to homemaking being shifting to the radio. She's also the first female food host on television with Mrs. Allen and the chef. So she's not, it's not the first cooking show, really, because she's not actually doing the cooking. It's kind of like Martha Stewart, you know, she has guest chefs, come on. Uh, and she is a prolific cookbook author, and she has some competition from our other cookbook authors. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see just a small selection of her cookbooks. So her first, one of her first ones was um, Mrs. Allen's Cookbook, published in 1917, right? So probably just prior to her entrance into World War I. And her very last one was published the same year she died, which is Best Love Recipes of the American People, published in 1973. Um, one of my favorites of hers, which I have, which I love, um, can I find it? It's a Money Saving Cookbook, which was published in 1942. Uh, so it includes World War II friendly recipes, but it's just a fascinating cookbook full of like all kinds of recipes that you wouldn't think of. Like um, the other day I was telling my friend about it and I said one of her recipes is um, macaroni and cheese stuffed tomatoes, which I thought sounded delicious. And then my friend, you know, I just mentioned it offhand and then my friend went and made it and she said it was really good. <laughs> so that's the kind of stuff I love in cookbooks, but Anyway, that's Mrs. Allen. If you go to the next slide, you can see a couple of her books. Um, I love the 104 prize radio recipes, not 101, 104. All right, and now we are in the Great Depression. So there are actually much fewer cookbooks published during the Great Depression for a variety of reasons. Um, So the Great Depression did not affect the entire country equally. Right, I think a lot of modern Americans associate the Great Depression with the Dust Bowl or Hollywood, right? Because if you think about it, throughout the 1930s, um, you know, the whole decade of 1930 is essentially the Great Depression. Uh, but Hollywood is producing a lot of very glamorous um, movies in the 1930s, right? So it's kind of like what's the Hollywood version versus the reality? Um, And for certain parts of the country, particularly in the Dust Bowl, uh, your cooking options are very limited. So a lot of people living in the Dust Bowl were farmers. And even if you weren't a farmer, if you lived in a rural area, you probably still had a kitchen garden. And that was not possible during the Dust Bowl. So people who had come to rely on kitchen gardens as sort of subsistence farming in a way, even though you have a cash crop, usually grain, um, a lot of people did still use gardens for subsistence. That's not possible during the Dust Bowl. So you rely on things like salt pork, white flour, sugar, lard, um, cornmeal, beans, right? Like all these kind of staple foods that are usually augmented by fresh fruits from your garden become your only food waste. Uh, a lot of people also are quite poor during the Great Depression. You might live in a not the Dust Bowl and you can have a uh, kitchen garden, like my relatives did in North Dakota, but, you know, you're still quite poor, so how can you stretch foods or make foods interesting? And so you start to get the rise of Americanized ethnic foods. And I want to make a little bit of a distinction here, because this has become kind of a thing in the last couple of years to criticize immigrant food ways as not authentic. Um, I am not talking about that here. 
what I am talking about is white Americans taking ethnic foods and Americanizing them, right? So Italian and Mexican and Chinese food existed in the United States as immigrant food ways prior to the Great Depression. And that is immigrants from those groups adapting their food ways to what's available locally. Um, this specifically is you know, kind of taking basically ground beef and giving it like the barest whiff of ethnicity so that you can have some variety in your diet. So like Mexican food, um, when I'm talking about Americanized ethnic foods, I mean things like tamale pie, which is basically meat and tomatoes. And if you're really adventurous, they'll put some chili powder in there. And then you put cornmeal mush on top and you bake it. So it's kind of like a tamale. Not really though, but it's super cheap. Right, it's super cheap and super filling. Um, and Italian food, you know, you get spaghetti and tomato sauce, right? That's with no garlic because we're racist about garlic in the 1930s. <laughs> and then your Chinese food is chop suey, which in some places is chili mac and in other places actually has like soy sauce in it. Um, but again, it's like, how do you stretch ground beef and make it interesting? Right. So that's what I mean when I say Americanized ethnic foods. And this all becomes popular in the Great Depression. Also, macaroni and cheese becomes super popular in the Great Depression because cheese is way cheaper than meat. Um, and then also, as is the case with any time that you have any kind of economic hardship in the United States, you get nostalgia for the past. So colonial revival really starts in the 19 teens. Interestingly, not in the 1870s with the centennial. We're much too focused on the future at that point. Um, but in the 19 teens and really through World War II, um, colonial revival is a big thing. We get start, started really interested in New England foods um, and kind of like what does it mean to be an American kind of stuff. So that starts happening in the 1930s. All right. Also in the 1930s, if you go to the next slide, another cook of coffee you've probably heard of, Irma Rombauer, right? Irma von Starkloff Rombauer. Um, writes a cookbook. So her husband commits suicide in 1930. Um, she's a housewife. Her daughter convinces her to write a cookbook. So she does. Um, and her contribution to cookbooks is that she has a very chatty, friendly style of writing. Not unlike Fanny Farmer, who's very scientific and like follow this perfectly and everything will turn out fine. Irma Ramba was more like, hey, if you want to change this, you can. Here's some suggestions, you know? Uh, and then her daughter, Marion, uh, helped and did all the illustrations. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the original cover, which is astonishingly 1930. So she actually self-publishes in 1931. <clears throat> it's quite expensive for her to do so. And then it gets picked up for professional, professional publication in 1936, but that's her original 1931 cover. Um, which is basically this must be like the sainted housewife in medieval garb beating back a dragon with a broom. But it's called the joy of cooking, right? <laughs> so that's another thing that's a little bit different to the title, the joy of cooking. Uh, Irma is positing that cooking is fun and rewarding, which has not been a lot of the rhetoric throughout the first half of the 20th century, right? Um, and it becomes this enduring tome. It's huge. It's like an encyclopedic tome. But because of how it's written, it's quite approachable. Um, and you get eight different editions, all slightly different, right? They get updated every time a new one is published. All right, so if you go to the next slide. Now we're in World War II, right? So we've learned the lessons of World War I. This time around, we have mandatory rationing. But again, there's an emphasis on victory gardens and canning. Um, a lot of the nutrition science research that began in the 1900s, um, particularly around vitamins, has really exploded by the time we get to World War II. There's actually um, a very interesting uh, report that comes out in 1941 that's basically a report of the health of drafted men, right? So in 1941, prior to our entrance in the war, um, or possibly right after, I actually don't know the exact chronology, I should look it up. Uh, but anyway, so whenever we institute the draft, all of the young men who have to register for the draft have to undergo a health check. And there's a report released at the time that 40% of those young men are malnourished. 
So like subsequent historians have looked at it and they say that that number is actually not accurate, but that's the number that was publicized at the time. And everybody freaks out about that. Like these young men are supposed to be the cream of America's crop, right? We have to meet, have military readiness and we're not ready. We're malnourished. So that ends up having a big impact on a lot of subsequent programs, including a huge emphasis on vitamins and nutrition and also things like the School Lunch Act of 1946, right, which mandates um, that all schools serve lunch to children. Um, if you flip to the next one, you'll see a couple of um, cookbook covers. Like, so there are way more World War II influenced cookbooks than World War I, in part because we're in the war for a lot longer. You also get wartime editions of pre-existing cookbooks. Um, I have in my collection a fairly influential cookbook called The American Woman's Home. Um, I have like four different versions of it, um, but there is 1942, they come out with a victory edition, which is basically the same cookbook, but they have expanded um, sections in the back on rationing, um, like the use of leftovers, and then uh, food preservation, right, canning and stuff like that. Um, but vitamins become the emphasis. You can see uh, both of these. There's the Victory Vitamin Cookbook, right? And the other one says the Victory Cookbook. So there's a lot of that rhetoric in cookbooks at the time. And if you go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about vitamins. Um, this is Adele Davis. Uh, she becomes known as America's nutritionist. So she starts out in the 1930s. She goes to home economics school. Um, she gets her degree in home economics and nutrition, and she starts publishing cookbooks in the 1930s. But she really ends up being super influenced by basically the diet that's promoted throughout World War II, which is organ meats, right, because we have meat rationing, so there's a lot of emphasis on organ meats. Milk, still the perfect food. Um, and then cooking methods to preserve vitamins, which is a big emphasis during World War II. How do you not cook vegetables to death? Uh, and how do you not cook meat to death so that you're preserving the vitamins and minerals um, and not boiling it away, right? She also becomes famous for inventing granola and yogurt. Obviously, she doesn't, but she popularizes it. Uh, and she becomes very popular in the 1960s as kind of like a guru to young hippies, right? So if you go to the next slide, she publishes uh, a bunch of books. Her most famous ones are Let's Cook It Right, Let's Have Healthy Children, Let's Eat Right to Keep Fit, and Let's Get Well. So Let's Cook It Right I have, and it's very interesting cookbook. Like I said, very World War II influenced, quite reasonable. I would eat most of the recipes in there. Um, she does like to add powdered skim milk to a lot of things because she thinks that that improves the nutrition content which arguably, you know, you can argue whether or not it does. But in the 1950s, she kind of moves away from food and toward vitamins. She becomes a proponent of megadosing of vitamins. Um, so then I think she kind of takes that, that uh, vitamin rhetoric of World War II kind of to heart, but she, along with a bunch of other people, take it too far. And this is not really a fringe... Um, thought process, although she was kind of viewed as a quack by doctors. It was more for her ideas on nutrition than on vitamins, right? So the 1940s and 50s were all about butter and sugar and red meat and white bread, you know, just like we were at the turn of the 20th century. And she's like, no, 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 you should eat whole grains and organ meat and not eat sugar. Have blackstrap molasses instead, you know, like, so people thought she was crazy for her nutritional claims. But the vitamin stuff, you know, like I said, we we're still kind of discovering vitamins until the late 1940s, early 1950s. And a lot of people were really starting to see them as kind of like miracle, you know, these essential elements in food. And with Adele Davis, there was a guy by the name of Linus Pauling, who is actually the only person to have won two separate Nobel Prizes. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for his anti-war work and he won a Nobel Prize in science because he was microbiologist, chemist, something like that. Anyway, quite a famous person. He also adopts um, this rhetoric of megadosing of vitamins 
is like a miracle cure for all kinds of stuff. So Adele Davis starts to promote in the 1950s and 60s megadosing of vitamins as cures for all sorts of ordinary things. And in the 1970s, two children actually die because their parents take advice that she gave um, in her books. One of them dies of a childhood disease that the mother tried to cure with vitamins. The other one dies of a vitamin over overdose. Um, and at that point, the medical community that had just kind of been ignoring her went back and looked at her books and looked at all of her footnotes, because of course they're footnoted extensively, you know, thousands of footnotes. And they found that she either misinterpreted the data or that her citations were just wrong. So she dies in 1974 of cancer, ironically, because that's one of the things that she claimed negative thing of vitamins could cure, um, pretty much discredited uh, and ostracized by a lot of the community, which, I mean, like, if she had just stuck with the nutrition thing, I think she would have been much better off because a lot of what she was advocating for today, we realize, is actually quite sound nutrition advice. You know, you should be eating a lot of fruits and vegetables with high vitamin content and cooking food to preserve their vitamins. You should be eating mineral-rich organ meats. You should be eating whole grains. You should be eating less sugar, right? These are all things that she advocated for. But when she got into the vitamin negative, and that's where everything kind of went off the rails, right? So anyway, okay. We can move on to the next slide. So I just remember I said Adele Davis was viewed as kind of like a quack. That's because post-war, it was like as soon as we got off rationing, we went hog wild with fat and sugar, all kinds of fun stuff. So post-war, we do have some kind of international food trends that GI spring back from Europe and the Pacific. So Polynesian cuisine um, becomes super popular, which for most Americans means let's just put a pineapple on it, right? So we have dull pineapple barbecue sauce, <laughs> not actually Polynesian. Um, you get a renewed interest in Chinese food and you get a kind of interest in Japanese food. French haute cuisine becomes very popular and Italian food become as popular again um, because people were exposed to Italian food in Italy. Um, you also have rising prosperity. Uh, you have increasing access to convenience foods. You get the rise of the supermarket, which starts in the 1940s, right? So you can go and select your own foods from a kind of dizzying array of choices. You're not limited by, um, you know, what your grocer selects for you. And there's still this sense that has continued throughout the 20th century of corporations as experts, right? They're the ones with the trained home economists. They're the ones with the scientists with their test kitchens, you know, doing their research. They're still experts. That starts to change in the 1960s. But for now, that's where we are. All right. If you go to the next one, you probably recognize this lady, Julia Child, born in California to very Republican father. <laughs> She ends up working for the Office of Strategic Services during World War II, and she meets Paul Child in Southeast Asia, and they get married. And then Paul um, is stationed in France post-war, and she, as a housewife, doesn't have anything to do. She doesn't want to go back to being a secretary for the OSS. Um, so she's trying to figure out what to do with her life and decides she loves to eat, so she is going to learn how to cook. So she ends up going to the Cordon Bleu, uh, with a bunch of American GIs, she's the only woman in her class, and she learns how to cook French food, and she gets really good at it. Um, she ends up meeting a couple of French women who are writing a cookbook for a French cookbook for Americans, because that's what Julia had been trying to find and never found. That's why she went to cooking school. Um, and so she ends up working with, uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see a picture of them. Uh, Simone Beck and Louisette Bertrand, and they end up eventually publishing Mastering the Art of French Cooking, which is basically Julia takes uh, Simca, is what they call Simone Beck, takes Simca's recipes and Louisette's recipes and basically home economizes them, for lack of a better word. She makes them very scientific. They do recipe testing. Um, she kind of takes a leaf out of Fanny Farmer's page, right, and makes it easy to understand and explains all the rationale and the science and there's diagrams. 
and makes it really easy to understand. But, you know, she starts this work in the 1940s and it doesn't get published until 1961. It actually gets rejected by a number of publishers um, until, uh, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking her name. She worked for Alfred A. Knopf, um, Judith Jones, her manuscript lands on the desk of Judith Jones, who gives it the title Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Um, and it becomes very popular. So she leverages that into a second volume, which she does just with Simca, because uh, if anybody knows the story, that really didn't do a whole lot. So they kind of get rid of her for the second volume. Excuse me. And she becomes both a prolific cookbook author and uh, one of our first uh, TV celebrities, TV cooking chef celebrities. Not the first. There were other women who and men who were cooking on television before her, but her role on PBS becomes very influential. Um, the last book, My Life in France, which was published posthumously in 2006 with Alex Prudhomme, actually tells the whole story of how she came to write Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Um, I do recommend it if anybody wants to learn more about her. It's very good. It's also the movie Julia and, Ju Julie and Julia, the Julia Child parts were based on that book, My Life in France. All right, so the next slide is just a picture of her famous two-volume cookbook. All right, so that's the 1960s, and I wanted to talk about Colonial Revival a little bit because it does end up being very influential on cookbooks. So as we talked about, Colonial Revival really starts in the 1920s and 30s. It's popularized in the 1940s, but it's really the bicentennial which has a huge impact on cookbooks. So 1976, there's a huge revival of interest in regional food ways, right? And state-based cuisine. Um, there's a renewed interest in food history, which again, 1970s, we're kind of starting to get more interest in social history. So women's history, the history of minorities, the history of working class people, you know, not the rich white dead guys. Um, and that includes food history. You start to get food interpretation at historic sites like Old Sturbridge Village, like Colonial Williamsburg. Um, and you also start to get the recording of more oral histories and the writing of more memoirs about pre-war food ways. So you get with Alan Lomax and people like that, the Smithsonian Folk Life um, Institute, you you start to get the recording of more of these oral histories as people are trying to capture the experiences of people who were alive in the 19th century, right? Who are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s in the 1970s. Um, you get the publication of, like I said, a lot of memoirs. Um, particularly, there's a whole subset of memoirs, which I love, of um, food in Europe prior to World War II. That becomes kind of a thing. Um, and if you go to the next slide, our next cookbook author um, kind of jumps on that bicentennial bandwagon a little bit. So this is Edna Lewis. Um, she's not particularly well known, I don't think, among ordinary Americans, but she is very well known among foodies and chefs and cookbook authors. She is one of the most famous African-American cookbook author. So that's why I call her the first African-American celebrity chef. Um, she's definitely not the first cookbook author. There are a number of people who uh, uh, come before her. And if anybody wants to learn more about African-American cookbooks, I highly recommend uh, The Jemima Code by Tony Tipton Martin. It's not as in-depth as I would like, which is sad, but it is an amazing catalog of African-American cookbooks published in the United States um, dating back to Melinda Russell. And even earlier, actually, there's a couple of uh, stewards manuals that were published by African-American men um, in the 1840s, I believe. Anyway, so Edna Lewis, uh, again, these cookbook authors have these kind of incredible lives. So she is born in rural Virginia. She moves to New York City at age 16. She has a whole bunch of different jobs, including working for a communist newspaper. And she ends up as a restaurant cook in 1949 at Cafe Nicholson, which is a fairly famous um, cafe in Harlem, frequented by a bunch of authors, actors, actors, artists. Eleanor Roosevelt went there. And in the 1960s, she embraced her leg, so she can't cook. But she knows Judith Jones, again, the woman who discovered Julia Child, right? And Judith Jones encourages her to write a cookbook. 
which she does. She writes the Edna Lewis cookbook. If you go to the next page, I'll show you in 1972, she writes the Edna Lewis cookbook. And then in 1976, our Bicentennial Connect collection, Connection, she writes The Taste of Country Cooking, which is about the food that she ate growing up in rural Virginia. Um, that's one of my favorites. So again, she's not a super prolific cookbook author, but she is very influential. She brings kind of this style of cooking um, that had sort of been lost. I think it's like a very, um, I shouldn't say very simple because it's not actually that simple, but it's, it's almost got like a delicacy to it, the way that she cooks. It's not very heavy handed cooking, I guess I'll say that. Um, uses a lot of fresh ingredients. So it kind of puts this new, it's not really new, but this different spin on Southern food than a lot of people associated with at that time. All right, if you go to the next one. So in the 1970s, we get kind of our health food craze, right? Uh, you got a rise in vegetarianism. There's interest in uh, tofu, right, and Middle Eastern food, Japanese food. Um, in the 1980s, you start to get an obsession with fat reduction, right? You get like egg white omelets and boneless, skinless chicken and <laughs> low fat yogurt and everything. Um, the organic movement also really starts to take off in the 1970s. So that's obviously Alice Waters at Chez Panisse. Um, and Alice Waters is very influential because of, she basically looks at the cuisines of France and Europe, but particularly France, and how French food is so good because of the ingredients, right? It's good because of the style of cooking, excuse me, but it's mostly the quality of the ingredients. And she thinks to herself, California is the world salad bowl. Like we have super high quality ingredients here. We can cook with American ingredients and show the world that American food can be just as good as, as the haute cuisine of Europe, right? So that's, that's her influence is basically the creation of the new California cuisine that ends up being called. So to go to the next slide, um, we do start to get more and more interest in international food, um, the 80s and 90s, get really, then actually this is from the 1970s, a picture of sushi, um, Japanese cuisine and sushi, minimalist cuisine with like baby vegetables and microgreens. So that's where you get the giant plate at fancy restaurants with the teeny tiny thing like composed on it. There's a renewed interest in farm to table food, which is spurred by Alice Waters and the new California cuisine. You get a renewed interest in Southern Italian peasant food, so like Tuscan food in particular. There's a renewed interest in Mexican food, um, thanks to people like Rick Bayless and Diane Henry, which can argue about cultural appropriation, and I won't necessarily disagree with you, but, but there's a renewed interest in that. And then we have the Silver Palette cookbooks. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is a cookbook that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. Again, not super influential with ordinary Americans, but I include it because a lot of food writers, other cookbook authors, restaurateurs um, refer to it. So here on the cover of this book, which is like an anniversary publication, I think it's got one of James Beard Award. You know, it's got Thomas Keller quoted on the cover of it. So it's published in 1982 by Julie Rosso and Sheila Lukens. And its influence is that it has, it's kind of like this fusion American cuisine. It's got Asian, Spanish, and Mediterranean foods, a ton of French food, and but it's still an American cookbook, right? So it's teaching Americans kind of what Alice Waters starts with the new California cuisine, like how can you kind of break out of the traditional American foods in new and interesting ways. And it's totally from scratch. So one thing I did not talk about post-war is the continued prevalence of corporate cookbooks and corporate recipes. You also get the rise of, um, you know, like Better Homes and Gardens, magazine series Sunset, publishes all these different cookbooklets, things like that. Um, Good Housekeeping and their whole series of cookbooks that starts in the 1950s, little cookbooklets, right? And a lot of that is open to cannabis. Take a box of that, 
whatever. Um, the Silver Palette Cookbook is like, nope, we're going to cook from scratch. We're going to cook American from scratch. We're going to cook inspired American from scratch. Um, and that's what makes it so influential. It's a kind of a whole generation of foodies and food people, right? All right, so we're almost done. Second to last slide. <laughs> Uh, from the 1990s on, we really get the rise of celebrity chefs and television, and that ends up having a huge influence on um, cookbooks because a lot of these people produce cookbooks. So on PBS, you have Martin Yen with Yen Can Cook. You have Lydia Bastianich with Lydia's Kitchen. Of course, you have Julia Child. Um, then you get the Food Network, which actually dates back to, I think it's Possibly the Food Network starts in like 1989, and Bonnie Flay has been on the Food Network since like 1991. 1991, he started on the Food Network, and he's still on the Food Network, which is sort of crazy to think about. Um, and then my personal favorite, you get food tourism with people like the late great Anthony Bourdain. You get Am Andrew Zimmern, Guy Fieri, who everybody loves to hate on, but who I think is actually a pretty stand-up guy. Um, and all of this starts to influence how Americans cook, how cookbooks are written, um, and how we view food, right? So prior to celebrity chefs, you know, nobody was taking pictures of their, their dinners, people. Like, <laughs> um, we start to get really interested in how food looks in addition to how it tastes, which is ironic because that's kind of a harkening back to the turn of the 20th century. All right, last slide. So we have our 21st century dietary trends. So the 21st century of the 2000s, there's a ton of interest in diets and dieting. Um, I have medical vegetable primeval, so that's like, you know, gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan, vegetarian. Primeval is paleo, which is a term that I hate because paleo food is actually not paleolithic at all. Call it whatever you want. It's not paleolithic. Um, and then the rise of clean eating, like keto, whole 30, stuff like that. Um, you get a rise of interest in heirloom vegetables. So in the 1990s, if you went to a grocery store, you were not going to find heirloom tomatoes on the shelf. But they're everywhere now, right? Heirloom apples are more and more of a thing. Um, in the 20th century, you get everybody talks about food, but who actually cooks, right? I think maybe during the pandemic, more of us are cooking than previously. But there definitely was a very strong culture of restaurant food, um, really, that continues even until now. And then you also have issues of food justice. So is it farm to table or food desert? Or a new term that's been coined recently is food swamp, which is a place where food is abundant but terrible for you, right? A food desert is a place where grocery stores are non-existent. And a food swamp is like where there's, you know, tons of fast food and liquor stores and things like that, but no access to high quality food. So those are the questions that face us in the 21st century. So that concludes my talk, you guys. I know it was a little crazy and I know we cut out in the middle, <laughs> but I think actually I have internet again. So I am going to log in to my, uh, with my computer so I actually can actually read what's in the chat because that's very hard to do yeah. on my phone. Mm -hmm. So I'll so stop So if sharing. Kimana will let me in. Oh, yes. <laughs> I go. will Sorry. switch. Oh, I can admit myself. Oh, that's Yes, so you funny. can because you're a co-host. <laughs> All, right. All, right. All right. Oh, oh hold on. Oh. Okay, I turned off the phone. Okay, so now I'm gonna make you, actually, I'll, I'll just spotlight one of you. <laughs> yeah, I got rid of the other one. <laughs> All right. So if anyone has questions, please go. Uh, we had a few comments and this was great. Just great. I mean. <laughs> I know, and I can't see any of the comments in the chat, I realize now, because I'm I'm a new they're person. all, oh, you can. Oh, well, they're all here. Um, let's all right, see. you'll have to read them to me then. Um, somebody had to go, a uh, great program, but she had to go, she had another program. This is fun, informative, lecture, excellent. And joy of cooking. Somebody had a comment about the cover with the woman with the 
the dragon essence of servant serpent on the cover. I and... know it's not so funny that it's the joy of cooking, but then it's like, let's beat back the monster. Sort of slave to the grind, so to speak, to yep. the, to the chore. And then Anne had a question: Is there a library or museum with all these historic housekeeping and cookbooks? So uh, there's my library. No. <laughs> Okay, and this is actually my cookbook library behind me. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's kind yeah, of very extensive. Cool. Um, so there's actually not like a single library. A ton of the cookbooks prior to 1927 have been digitized and are available on places like Google Books, archive.org, um, Hath It Trust or Haughty Trust, I don't know how you pronounce it. I do also have a, a page on my website, thefoodhistorian.com that lists some of the historic cookbooks that you can access um, that have been digitized. But most of the like cookbook collections are kind of scattered around universities and stuff like that. There is no food history um, museum. Get on that Smithsonian and then please hire me to work there. <laughs> uh, the Smithsonian Museum of American History does actually have, they have started to do more food history interpretation. Um, but they don't have huge collections. The University of Michigan has a collection called uh, Feeding America, which has a lot mm. of cookbooks, including manuscript cookbooks, uh, which is kind of fun because those, you know, obviously are much rarer because there's only one version. Um, somebody mentioned the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana has a community cookbook collection, which I think um, Helen Zovite actually did a, an NEH funded project called, I believe it's called What America Ate. And that is about community cookbooks and the Federal Writers Project work into food recording during uh, the Great Depression. So that one is pretty cool. There is also, um, gosh, I don't remember where I just saw it. I'll have to see if I can find the link and maybe I'll, I'll post it somewhere. Um, I did see one university had like collected like all of the different repositories and I have some on my historic cookbook page on my website, some of the repositories that have collections, but I didn't have all of them. So I should probably just update that page if I can find it. But yeah, they're kind of scattered all over the place. And then you also have menu collections, which is like a whole mm. different thing that the, the Culinary Institute at Hyde Park has a huge menu collection that they did, they've digitized and also the New York Public Library has quite a large collection of menus that they've digitized. But yeah, the cookbook collections are kind of hit or miss. Well, so then we have to work on something for New York. Right. <laughs> and maybe in Westchester County, who knows? There you go. There's a question here from Donnie Radford. Note, I noticed the original cookbooks used the word receipt. When and why did the word receipt become recipe? That is a good question, uh, and I don't know, and I don't know that anyone really knows. Uh, I think it's just going to be a lot of speculation, um, but I think it is tied to like how we think of um, like receipts now, that it's like a record of a purchase. So the receipts in that term didn't really exist for most of the 19th century, right? You, like you had to keep your own account books and keep track of what you purchased and what you sold, depending on what your job was, right? Um, so I have to wonder if that's the connection is a lot of those manuscript cookbooks end up being written in account books. <laughs> and some people pronounce it receipt, some people pronounce it recipe, even though it's spelled receipt. Hmm. So that might also be why the spelling was just later changed to match the pronunciation, but I don't really know. Then a uh, okay. I was going to say, Rita from... just asked, what were the two health problems you mentioned concerning Adele Davis? Um, right, so her focus was on megadosing of vitamins, which is actually quite dangerous um, and is actually still a little bit of a problem. Um, I didn't mention this, but uh, vitamin D, for instance, um, I think it was vitamin D. Yeah, so in the United States, vitamin D is fortified in milk and margarine. But in Europe, um, you know, vitamin D deficiency causes rickets in children. So in Europe, initially, when they started fortifying foods with vitamin D, they fortified like breakfast cereal and milk and bread and everything was fortified with vitamin D and you got vitamin D poisoning with children. So um, 
yeah, you did you did start to understand that you could overdose on vitamins a little bit, but uh, a lot of people, you know, it's not just Adele Davis. Um, like I said, Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling is actually the person who connects vitamin C to the common cold, which is something that has no basis in science at all. Like there's no empirical evidence that vitamin C has any infect, impact on the common cold, but he wrote a whole book about it in the 1970s and he had two Nobel prizes. So people took him seriously and yeah. A lot of, lot of misinformation about vitamins out there. And Adele Davis was sadly one of the purveyors of that misinformation. So any other questions? There was another comment, but it looks like it only came to me about, um, this is Anne who said her favorite banana bread recipes from the Fanny Farmer cookbook. <laughs> and then I, said, I know a lot of people who still cook from that cookbook. Yeah. Don't forget Jeff Smith, the frugal gourmet, and Graham Care. Yeah, so this is why, I mean, I could just make this talk and be like five hours long and we could talk about a whole bunch of people. Like I don't talk about Betty Crocker. That's right, yeah. Right? So yes, um, but Graham Care, who's the galloping gourmet. Um, and oh gosh, what, you just said it, the other guy, oh, Jeff. Pro, um, yes, I did just say, and I closed the chat. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, Jeff Smith? Jeff, the frugal yes, gourmet. Jeff Smith wrote the frugal gourmet and Car Graham Kara is the galloping gourmet. He had a television show. So both of them are fairly influential in kind of bringing, bringing European cuisine to like ordinary Americans, largely in the 1980s. So. Fran has a question for you. Yes, Fran said, not sure if I missed this, but what's my favorite cookbook? Oh. I'll answer that one second. And then she says, don't forget Emeril Lagasse, one of the first on the Food Network. Oh, you worked with him. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I did forget Emeril. I'm so sorry about that. Did I put Mario Batali on the list? I don't remember. No, anyway. I don't think so. Um, and then James I also Beard. don't talk about James Beard at all, James which maybe Beard. I should. Yeah. Although there's a new um, book out by someone I know, actually. Her name is Emily Contois. Um, and it's called, oh gosh, let me get the title right. Um, she wrote about men and food. I think it's called, is it Dude Diet? Oh, uh, why can't I find it? Anyway, she just came out with a new book um, about the history of men and food, and I bet James Beard is in there. Anyway, um, okay, so what's my favorite cookbook? I don't have a favorite cookbook. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't have a favorite cookbook. I love vintage cookbooks, though, and I'm usually very interested in easy cake recipes <laughs> and interesting vegetable recipes, but I, I do not have a favorite cookbook. I don't cook from a lot of cookbooks unless it's a historic recipe that I want to try out. I just get in inspiration from cookbooks, but Deborah Madison is pretty awesome as a cookbook author. Uh, Dory Greenspan has never failed me. Yeah, they're pretty great. Any other questions? Any other questions? And you have a book coming out soon, not a cookbook, but a, well. Not coming not out soon. soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's not done, you guys. All right, no worries. But it went through peer review like three <laughs> years ago and I work full time and it's been hard to to implement a lot of the changes, but I'm, I'm slowly getting there. I have, um, I'm about halfway through two new chapters, but it's about food um, more broadly during World War One and specifically to New York State. Um, but yeah, it does also talk a lot about food conservation. So, you know, canning, kitchen, stuff like that. Somebody raise their hand, Symphony. You can unraise your hand if you want. Unmute and tell us your question. Oh, when, when will the recording be available? Oh, this recording? Well, let's see, what's today? Monday? And then I give it to my colleague <laughs> who will work magic, you know, edit out the, the gap. Yeah, all the times that I was Yeah, it wasn't that, that long. <laughs> it wasn't really, it felt long to you, but it was a matter of a few minutes. And so hopefully by the end of the week, you know, because he's doing other things in addition to editing the, the, the videos, the clips. So uh, by the end of the week, hopefully, I'll, I'll email everyone to let you know. And uh, 
you know, this is really great. I feel like I need to sign up for some classes now on this history, which I find is so fascinating from an historical point of view and just thinking of the art history and the culture and all of the, there's so much. It's all interconnected, which is, the food. yeah, yeah, it's, that's not how it's presented a lot, which drives me crazy. Um, but that's what I like to do is mm. make those connections with the context of what's going on and what's influencing what and new technologies <laughs> and agriculture and all that fun stuff. Yeah, because it's um, easy to forget. All right, Lorraine asked a question. She said, have you ever heard of the New American Cookbook? And I have to tell you, Lorraine, it sounds vaguely familiar, but I don't know anything specific about it off the top of my head. When you were uh, disconnected before, um, Sarah, I mentioned to the ladies that upstate New York, or the participants, uh, upstate New York at the Farmer's Museum, they offer a one-week course during the summer, The Frugal Housewife. And yes, they, they fun. Actually, yeah, they use that book, and it's very interesting. That's awesome. Yes, that's a Lydia Maria Child book, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. She is such a fascinating figure. I'm, I want somebody to make a movie about her life. Rita, did you have a question? I see your yes. hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, maybe something that might interest you. I have a book here. I went down to find it. Columbus's Menu. Uh, and one section, the first section is on the tomato. So... You mentioned earlier the controversial tomato. <laughs> they have a whole section on tomato. <laughs> I will have to look that one up. That's one I haven't heard of. But yeah, I mean, you know, so tomatoes and potatoes are part of the nightshade family. And guess what the next session is on? Section, potatoes. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. Yes, but like, tomato leaves are actually quite poisonous for people. Um, only the fruit is edible. So when it was first introduced in Europe, it was a decorative plant because they thought it was poisonous. Have you, have you read the book Delicious by Ruth Reichel? Um, it, it's interesting. And she refers to James Beard explaining, I guess, during the Depression uh, to someone how they can use the leaves from a zucchini plant. Oh, yeah. Yep. I thought you were going to say tomato. I was like, don't do that. No, no. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a lot of, um, I could just, there's so many more cookbooks I could talk about you guys, but yeah, I've, we've market. already been talking for like two hours. I think I need to, I've actually been thinking about doing like a class, like an online class about yeah. cookbooks so and American much. food. Cause so yeah. this could be I like think, a 20 hour class. I think. That would be great. <laughs> Now, I have a quick question, though, because you did mention about cookbooks and men, uh, but, you know, sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, the best cooks, the best chefs are all men. When That's do men right. come into, I know, I don't agree with that, but it, oh, no. yeah, when yeah. did that shift where, you know, you, you may, most of all the people you talked about up until the 1980s, I'd say, 70s, 80s, were women. Yes, and I did not do that on purpose, by the way. Somebody asked me last time I did this talk, where are all the men? And I was like, listen, I forgot about them, okay? Oh, okay. So it wasn't, so it, seem to it be was a not popular. a conscious, it was not a conscious yeah. omission. Um, so yeah, but there is a divide. And it's basically, if you can make money doing it, you it's do. usually a man's job. Where is okay. Escoffier in, in the history of all of this? Sorry, say that again. Where is Escoffier? What? Where he is, is the 1890s. Uh -huh. And he really, I actually talk about him in my, I'm doing a talk this week, next week. Oh my gosh, I don't even remember you guys. On um, the history of macaroni and cheese. Ooh. And I'll talk about him a little bit because he popularizes <laughs> the French mother sauces, but that's in the 1890s. So. Where's that talk going to be? Oh gosh, let me look at my follow calendar. you. <laughs> Uh, it's on my website. Um, All right, we'll check your website. Do you want to type in your website? I, I think it was sure. on your Sure, okay, so it's, it's next Tuesday with the Rye Free Library. Oh, nice, okay. Um, in the evening. We can uh -huh. head over there, it's nearby. <laughs> wonderful thing about having all these talks virtually you can go to anything no matter where it is although it's if it's a, in a different time zone you kind of have to remember yeah um, but yeah Escoffier is in 1896 93 some, sometime in there 1890s um so yeah I talk about him and then uh 
Marie Antoine Carême, also, who's late 18th century French, very influential French chef. But yeah, it's like if you can be a chef and you can get paid to do it, um, it's usually a man. Interesting. <laughs> yep. And that's why, I mean, I don't really talk about this much in the talk because it's a little esoteric, I think, for a lot of people, but you're all still here, so you must be interested <laughs> enough to hear it. Um, but it's this very interesting thing that women kind of leverage their domestic skills to have lives outside of the, the pigeonhole of domesticity. So these women are writing cookbooks and some of them are making careers, giving advice to women who are running households when they don't even have kids and they're not married, right? So it's this very interesting way that women can, can kind of make a name for themselves and make a way for themselves in this very narrow path that's offered to them and they take this tiny little branch, right? That's not the get married and have kids and do nothing with your life because you're not allowed, but you can have a career so long as it's still kind of in this same pathway. So, and I actually, I just did a blog post about um, yesterday, Sunday about African-American women cooks and how they leverage their domestic skills to make a living for themselves in the 19th century, which is a time when a lot of African-Americans, especially African-American men, did not have access to jobs that would allow them to support their families. So women, African-American women, Black women in particular, women of color, have had to work outside the home for a very long time because that discrimination prevents them from having the traditional like nuclear family where the dad works and yeah. supports the family and the mom stays home right yeah. so that goes way back um but i talk about ann northup who i talked about today i talk about melinda russell and i talk about abby fisher um who published a cookbook it's what mrs fisher knows about southern cooking in the 1880s um and kind of how they were able to um use their skills as cooks and experts in cooking um, to make a living, so. Right. Well, this was wonderful, really wonderful. And we're happy to have you back March 8th, Monday, March 8th. That'll be our first food lit cookbook. I know, it's coming up. And I think we're talking about Nick Sharma and Dan Klugger. Is that the one we're doing the food? Okay, well, we'll look into it. <laughs> we'll look into it and but join us because I think it'll be fun and we could talk about what we want to feature because uh, we do we did have the two cookbook authors last month. March is also very um, traditional for Irish cooking, not only Irish cooking, but, you know. And so, it's Women's History Month. And it's Women's History Month. So, so maybe we, we should really talk about male cookbook authors. Well, we could do a, a variety <laughs> of things. So, and it'll be our first first food lit book club so we hope you'll join us and yeah, that will yeah. be at seven that will be at our regular time this was a one-off so sorry about that um that's okay that, <laughs> i just uh, wrote it down we, wrong just so you know the planning for these programs are months and months in advance so when we talked about this i think it was over the summer yeah so it, it was just, a while ago it was a while ago so but thank you so much i hope you get to have your dinner because <laughs> i'm surprisingly <laughs> not hungry Cooking, look at that <laughs> and i'm not hungry but well, oh and then i did want to mention um before i go that the new book out by emily contois is diners dudes and diets <laughs> how gender and power collide in food media and culture so if anybody wants to check that out that like just came out well, we should see if she'll come and, and uh give her talk Oh, what was it? I had dudes and I put the wrong title. Diners, in. dudes, and diet. Oh. Here, I'll type it in. Diners, dudes, and diet by Emily Contois. Excellent. Oh, sorry, Contois. There's no E on the end of her last okay. name. All right. All right. So that concludes our program for tonight. Thank you, everyone who stayed. We had a wonderful turnout, actually. And I guess all that talk about food <laughs> made people hungry. I don't know. But, um, this was really great and we'll look forward to seeing you in a in about a month's time yeah okay? we'll see you then. so Thanks sign everybody. off everyone nice to see you